Welcome to the Washington Institute. I'm Rob Satloff, the Executive Director, and I'm delighted to have you join for today's very special event. But before we start, just a advertisement for the Institute. I hope um, everybody who is watching has a moment after today's event to please go to the website of the Institute to check on our most recently produced Transition 2021 memos for the Biden administration. Um, just this week, we issued Matt Levitt's uh, very important and timely um, transition memo on how to, uh, how to um, define counterterrorism strategy for the new era, the post 9-11 era, 20 years after 9-11, as we enter um, a moment of uh, greater focus on great power competition, how we should refashion our counterterrorism strategy accordingly. This joins a long list of uh, transition memos that we've produced on a broad array of Middle East topics. Several more are still forthcoming. Please check that out at the website www.washingtoninstitute.org. And as long as I'm mentioning um, uh, checking out websites, if you have questions for today's speaker, um, you can uh, filter them into our conversation one of two ways. If you're participating on Zoom, please send them to me. Uh, via the Q&A function. And if you are on YouTube or any other outside platform, please feel free to email me directly at rsatloff at washingtoninstitute.org. And I'll do my best to bring your conversation, to bring your questions into today's conversation. Today, I'm really delighted that we are hosting my friend and colleague, Dave Schenker. Dave Shanker served for 19 months from June 2019 uh, through January of 2021 as the Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs, uh, the head of the Near East Affairs Bureau um, in the Department of State. In that position, he was the senior State Department official with specific responsibility for the broad region from Morocco to Iran and everything in between. Um, uh, Dave has been a uh, vital member of the Washington Institute for many years. He has served in government previously in the George W. Bush administration as Levant, Levant country director in the Pentagon. And he brought all that experience, academic policy practicing experience to his role at the State Department. We're very proud of uh, the contribution that you made to our American national security, Dave. And we are delighted to welcome you back as a senior fellow at the Washington Institute. So um, uh, to spill the uh, the inside scoop or the, uh, to spill the inside the beans on, on uh, um, the politics um, and policymaking um, inside the Trump administration State Department vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East, I'm very happy to welcome Dave Schenker. Dave. Well, thanks, Rob, for the the kind introduction. Uh, it's great to be back at the, the Washington Institute, my, my home base for the better part of the past 21 years. Uh, it was an honor and a pleasure to serve at the State Department. Uh, looking back, these uh, 19 past month, 19 months passed like a blink of an eye, but when I was there, it seemed like it was taking a lot longer. Uh, before I start, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to my former colleagues at the State Department, both the civil servants and the foreign service officers that I had the honor to serve with. Uh, the team in the NEA, uh, the Near East Affairs Bureau, is committed and highly talented. NEAers work on some of the most difficult issues and serve in some of the more dangerous posts in the world. Under enormous and sustained pressure, they keep their cool and maintain a sense of humor. They see their work as a calling, a, a vocation and an avocation uh, and a duty working with both Democratic and Republican administrations to advance U.S. interests abroad. They're great Americans and we're outstanding colleagues and um, we're lucky to have them. So a few years back uh, now, prior to joining the state, uh, Rob asked me what I thought would be the issue that I would spend most of my time on as Assistant Secretary. And I answered without hesitation, Iraq, and it turned out to be right. I started at state in the midst of the maximum pressure campaign on Iran. At the time, Iran and its proxies were involved in an escalating series of attacks on US allies in the region. My first day saw a lethal Houthi missile attack on Saudi Arabia. And soon after, Iran scuttled several, several ships in Fujairah and then targeted the Saudi oil processing facility in Abqaiq. 
Uh, but the front line of the U.S. maximum pressure campaign was, was Iraq, where Iranian-backed Shiite militia were periodically targeting the U.S. embassy in Baghdad and anti-ISIS coalition forces in the country. Uh, then uh, Iraqi Premier Otto Abdel Mahdi was doing precious little to undertake his Vienna Convention obligations to protect American diplomats. Uh, he likewise wasn't making any effort to move Iraq toward energy independence from Iran or to hold militia responsible for routine killing of demonstrators. After the orchestrated attack on the US Embassy in Baghdad, the killing of Qasem Soleimani, and the subsequent non-binding vote in the court to expel US troops, the situation further deteriorated, as did the relationship with Abdel Mahdi. The selection of Mustafa Kadami was a welcome change, and one that signaled the uh, an improvement in the dynamics between Washington and Baghdad. All told, over the course of my 19 months at state, I visited Iraq more than any other country about a dozen times. With the exception of about five months when we were grounded for COVID, I traveled there about every other month. I was on a plane to Erbil the night that Iranian missiles fell on US bases in Ain al-Assad and Erbil. Our diplomacy to Iraq and our signaling to Iran, I believe, was a was a modest success. Our goal wasn't to move Baghdad into an exclusive relationship with Washington, but rather to keep Iraq between the 40 yard lines in the middle of the field between the United States and Iran, which by virtue of geography and demography, uh, of course, has the home field advantage. I think we ended up hitting a lot of singles. First, who could have imagined after Abdel Mahdi's departure that Iraq would choose between Adnan Zerfi and Mustafa Qadhafi as the next premier? Second, who would have thought that a year after killing Soleimani, U.S. troops would still be in Iraq? We deployed our, we, we protected our people, we deployed patriots to coalition bases to defend our troops. We installed a CRAM at the embassy in Baghdad to secure our diplomats from indirect fire. Uh, during PM Prime Minister Kadhafi's visit to Washington in August of 2020, he signed billions of dollars of contracts with American companies including to capture gas flares in southern oil fields, a step on the road toward Iraqi energy independence. Uh, meanwhile, Kadami persists in arresting Iranian backed Shia militiamen who fired rockets and continue to fire rockets at Americans. So there's a long way to go on Iraq, but we're not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. But I think the situation as of January 2020 was relatively good. I also spent a lot of time contesting the space with Iran and Lebanon. And I think we got the policy there right too. As Lebanon careened toward financial collapse, we focused not on personalities, but on principles of transparency, fighting corruption and reform, all concepts that if implemented would un undermine Hezbollah. And we managed to keep the French on the reservation, preventing a bailout of the state prior to the implementation, implementation of critical economic reforms. In addition, we leveled a series of economic sanctions against Hezbollah and its allies, including, importantly, non-Shiites, culminating in the global Magnitsky designation of Gibran Basile for corruption, the president's son-in-law. We also convinced the French penholders at the UN to make some small but significant changes under threat of veto to UNIFO. Regrettably, the situation in Lebanon is likely to get worse before it gets better, but Washington can't want Lebanon to succeed more than the Lebanese political elites. It was with some degree of optimism that in the fall of 2020, I launched the maritime border delineation talks between Israel and Lebanon. I say some degree of optimism because based on my conversations with Lebanese counterparts, um, I hope Lebanon, I hope Beirut would negotiate in good faith with Israeli, Israelis to reach a compromise solution within the lines filed by the states at the United Nations. Alas, Lebanese leaders never fail to disappoint. The other, the other way things can get worse in Lebanon is another war with Israel, the chances of which seem to be getting better every day. Hezbollah continues apace with its precision-guided missiles upgrades and the import of more advanced anti-aircraft systems. Should Iran find itself once again flush with cash, with more money uh, to, that will flow to its proxies, uh, the tempo of Hezbollah's qualitative improvements and its capabilities will all but certainly increase, making a war uh, even more likely and very costly. Now, NEA is a big region. I'm not going to be able to touch on all of it today, but I would like to discuss 
two more issues that consumed much of my time during my tenure at state. Yemen, like Iraq and Lebanon, was another priority intersectional issue with Iran. Not only was it a humanitarian disaster, uh, but when I arrived at state, Saudi's conduct of the war was draining whatever currency Saudi had left with the US Congress. Over time, I believe our engagements with the Saudis, uh, the ambassador, Princess Rima, and Khaled bin Salman, or KBS, had a positive impact, encouraging Riyadh to move toward a positive and pragmatic approach and outlook on negotiations with the Houthis. Along the way, Saudi announced a few unilateral ceasefires. And in my view, KBS invested in diplomacy and engaged in goodwill negotiations with the Houthis. Saudi also donated several hundred millions of dollars to help feed Yemenis. The problem wasn't the Saudis. It was and remains the Houthis who, one, lie, two, don't keep agreements, and three, are committed to winning this war militarily. Now, as for the controversy surrounding the designation of the Houthis, let me say this. As of December 30th, Secretary Pompeo was, I believe, still considering and in the process of considering the designation. We had engaged with the NGO community, including David Beasley of the World Food Program, who expressed concerns about a chilling impact in humanitarian work in Yemen as a result of the designation. Now, we felt that we could mitigate the impact uh, of, the, of the sanctions through OFAC waivers. And in any event, US Department of Justice would never be prosecuting humanitarian organizations for inadvert inadvertent leakage to the Houthis. And then on December 30th, the Houthis missile attacked Aden Airport in an effort to kill the entirety of the new Yemeni government just then arriving by plane. And that was it, they were designated. Now we can debate about the impact of the designation, but by all standards, the connection with the IRGC, the kidnappings, the targeting of Saudi civilians, the Houthis meet the criteria of a foreign terrorist organization. This was not about Secretary Pompeo salting the earth. I tried to meet with the Houthis during my trip to Oman in December. Abdel Malik al-Houthi gave the, the Omanis a message for me, but they were not interested in engaging directly at that time with the administration. Now, as for critics who warned that a designation would drive the Houthis into the arms of Iran, it's a little bit late. The Houthis are already firmly in bed with the IRGC. And for those keeping score, the Houthis have responded to their delisting by increasing exponentially the operational tempo of their attacks on Saudi Arabia. And get ready, they eventually may look to target Israel. Now, on the plus side, the indefatigable and eternally optimistic UN Sec uh, Special Representative Martin Griffith still continues his work, and now he's joined by the excellent queer diplomat, my former Arabian Peninsula Deputy Assistant Secretary, Timothy Lenderkin. So I'm optimistic about that combination. The final issue I want to mention today is China, which although not technically hosted or housed in NEA, is increasingly present in the NEA region. When I talked about China with our friends in the Middle East, including Israel, I wasn't asking them to make a choice between the US and China, but discussing some of the risks entailed with doing business with the PRC. Debt traps, like the one Jordan got into in Adirat, compromised personal data with Chinese COVID testing labs and communications over, co over Huawei equipment. And of course, the challenges of maintaining a strategic relationship with Washington while flirting with or enhancing strategic cooperation with Beijing. And this is particularly an important issue in light of the Abraham Accords. Now, I believe that we laid down a good marker for our expectations going forward, but this too is a problem that will require continuous attention. For both Democratic and Republican administration, this is going to remain a critical issue. Now, just a few final thoughts before I conclude about the job of Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Near East Affairs. NEA has more failed and failing states per capita than any of the State Department's six regional bureaus. So it's easy to get caught up in the crisis of the day and lose sight of longer term priorities. When I started at State, I told Under Secretary uh, of State David Hale that I'd wanted to spend time working on Algeria, an important counterterrorism partner and a bilateral relationship with room to grow. My aspir aspirations though were overtaken by events. I wasn't able to get to Algeria until January, 2021. The same goes for my 
intention to try and repair Jordan's stress relationship with Israel. I took some steps in this front and things you know, fortunately look a little better these days, but I wasn't able to devote nearly as much time to that effort as I had hoped and the list goes on. Secondly, there for the assistant secretary there are the perennial so-called scene issues. The UAE is in Sudan and Djibouti, which is in, in the Africa Bureau. Likewise, Egypt's focused on the GERD in Ethiopia. Sudanese mercenaries are in Libya. So is Turkey and Russia, uh, both of which are in Europe. What happens in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. And many of the region's most complex problems have been exacerbated by external actors from outside the region, which requires a lot of coordination with other bureaus. Last but not least, it perhaps goes without saying that diplomacy can be a dangerous business. The safety and well-being of U.S. personnel in the Middle East uh, is an abiding priority for the Assistant Secretary. Now, Regional Affairs Officers, RSOs, and, and Diplomatic Security, or DS, are very good at their job, but it's a job that has zero margin of error. Instinctively, we want to err on the side of caution, but the work of diplomacy in several of the states in which NEA operates is inherently dangerous. Uh, no doubt, we can't be in every state, but the absence of ongoing US engagement has consequences. We have to be able to tolerate a certain degree of risk. Our diplomats understand that, and the NEA Assistant Secretary has to advocate for it. Uh, if we hope to get Libya right, our intrepid ambassador, Dick Norland, is gonna to have to periodically be on the ground with an eye toward a more enduring presence there. And we're gonna to have to be in Baghdad where our amazing ambassador, Matt Tuller, is engaging every day with the government of Iraq to press our interests. So those are just a few of my thoughts and um, I'm looking forward to, uh, to our conversation, Rob. Excellent, well, very useful. and. Um, uh, uh really eye-opening in many respects, I'm, I, I thank you. And again, just to our, our viewers, if you are in the, uh, the Zoom, please feel free to send me questions via the question and answer function, Q&A function. And if you're on any other platform, please feel free to email me directly at rsatloff, two Fs, rsatloff at washingtoninstitute.org. So David, I have a long list of questions, lots of topics, substantive as well as um, uh, sort of institutional about uh, about the job. Um, when you look back on your experience, uh, uh, is there some issue or some theme that uh, uh, you went in with into NEA with a certain um, preconceived notion? And then when you finally saw the details, when you finally understood all the complexity and the realities, you know, you said, oh my gosh, this is a lot more complicated than I originally thought. And this is gonna be a lot tougher to solve. I, yes, <laughs> um, no, across the board. I think actually the current administration, you know, which wants to make a clean break with the prior administration um, is currently in this process um, in NEA and elsewhere. They're taking a look at these issues and saying, hey, we don't think they did it right. And then they're digging down and seeing goodness these problems are incredibly complex. There's no, these aren't choices as I know as policymakers between good and bad, but bad and worse. Um, uh, one issue that I thought I might be able to solve and I had hoped to solve was a safer, the safer tanker um, off the coast of, of Yemen. Now this is a boat um, that is, you know, uh, an enormous oil tanker uh, that is what double, triple the size of, of the Exxon Valdez that is 40 years old and rotting, um, you know, just, uh, you know, some miles away from Bob um, If something should happen to this, this ship and the oil should leak, it not only will close Bob Almanda, but it will uh, prevent shipping through the Suez Canal. It will cause an environmental disaster that could stretch along the coast of Yemen all the way to Oman. Um, and so I, I figured, you know, hey, let me solve this. Um, but of course, um, it's not only the issue of uh, the Saudis and the Houthis, whether you can buy the Houthis temporarily or rent them to try and solve the situation. This for them is their nuclear weapon. You know, uh, it is um, um, an ace in, the, ace in the hole or an ace in the pocket. Um, I, I had hoped 
to be able to get to a solution on that and didn't get anywhere close. Um, smarter people than me have tried to come up with solutions. They've worked them and we're going nowhere fast. You know, fortunately, we finally got some, some people from the UN on the tanker to take a look and try and seal up some of the holes and, and prevent a catastrophe. But this is a, this is a disaster waiting to happen and I couldn't do anything about it. All right. Um, I, I, and since you mentioned the, the, uh, the tanker issue off the coast of Yemen, which many of our viewers may not be familiar with, I'm, I'm just going to uh, take a moment to explain another acronym you used in your talk. You referred to the GERD, uh, which of course is another acronym, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, a, um, uh, a potential hotspot um, uh, between Egypt and Sudan and Ethiopia. Um, so Dave, I want to ask you a, about a couple of themes and issues which didn't come up in your remarks, uh, but which are certainly high on the agenda for anyone um, uh, who focuses on um, the Middle East. Uh, let me begin with uh, Syria, um, a, th a, 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 a huge issue that engages so many different countries. Um, uh, now, this is an issue in which also touches on an, an administrative issue I wanted to ask you, which is um, in your administration that you served in, as well as previous administrations, there's always been back and forth on the use of special envoys for unique, um, uh, discrete uh, um, issues. Um, this is one of those issues. So both on the substance of Syria um, as a policy issue and on uh, the role of special envoys and their utility to address discrete issues, as opposed to the assistant secretary addressing an issue in your area of responsibility. Um, what do you come away with? What, what impressions does this leave you with? Listen, um, uh, there are, you know, depending on the administration, uh, a proliferation of special envoys. I think there were a couple dozen or more when, uh, when Secretary Pompeo came in or Secretary Tillerson before him. Um, and these are all people that answer directly to the secretary in terms of the chain of command. The secretary also has to supervise and engage directly with undersecretaries um, and with assistant secretaries. Um, uh, if you have too many, it's just uh, unworkable. Um, as for me, um, I was really pleased to have Jim Jeffrey um, working a uh, special envoy uh, for Syria. Um, not always Jim eminently qualified, uh, but this is a full-time job, right? Uh, you need somebody working this issue because it's not only Syria, it's all the international issues and all the engagements um, I couldn't have done that job and my job and, and uh, paid enough attention to what was going on there. Um, you know, there's a genocide in Syria. That more than half a million, mostly Sunni Muslims, have been wiped out by the Assad regime. Um, you need somebody working full time on this issue um, who is senior. Um, you know, the same can be said um, of Iran uh, with Brian Hook out there. Um, you know, the sanctions regime, the international engagements. Um, I had 18 countries. Um, these were crisis issues that required um, a special envoy. Now, there is an argument um, that we do have special envoys in places like Libya. I think, you know, Ambassador Norland is amazing and he is intrepid and he goes to Russia, he goes to Turkey, he goes to South Africa, he goes to the United Arab Emirates. Um, he is essentially our not only our ambassador, but our special envoy to Libya. Um, in some cases, this is not required, but certainly in states where you don't have ambassadors, um, it's, you know, I think very helpful. And the important thing is to have um, a, a, a constant line of communication with the assistant secretary, because the bureau is supporting the work that he does, and we have to be in lockstep. Um, the other issue I'll, I'll mention, um, I must have um, gotten requests from maybe a dozen or more Lebanese Americans, notes from Congress trying to point a special envoy to, Le to Lebanon. Um, now, State Department team was especially deep on Lebanon. It's an issue that I know very well and paid a great deal of attention to. David Hale, the undersecretary, had served three times, including as ambassador um, to Lebanon, and the secretary tracked it very closely. And with Dorothy Shea, we have an amazing ambassador there. Um, so it's not required. Um, and this is not um, a position um, that is best suited necessarily 
um, for, uh, for somebody from the outside. And so uh, let, let, let's look at the substance side of this. Um, uh, when you look back on uh, um, uh, the Trump administration's efforts in Syria, um, uh, uh, how, how do you grade this? Are we, are we closer to whatever a solution would be? And what, what does a solution to this crisis look like? Well, listen, I, I think that we, we got the policy right. Um, of course, um, very difficult situation with both the military and economic and, and political backing of the Russians for the Assad regime that really prevent anything being done within the UN context. But the idea was to put pressure on the regime to engage in a process. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe there wasn't enough time, but we have denied Assad a victory. Um, he still doesn't control a certain amount of the country where the U.S. has a presence. And uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces continue along with, with Kurds to, um, to fight ISIS in that area of the country, but denying Assad these revenues and preventing um, the reintegration um, of this pariah into both uh, the Arab fold and the international community, preventing the rebuilding of, of Assad Syria. I think um, this puts a certain amount of pressure, but um, it, maybe it was the amount of time given, maybe it will never succeed. Uh, but I, I think that there are just some, some leaders that are beyond the pale, particularly those who perpetrate genocides. Um, so connected to this is one of the great powers. Um, uh, you referred in your opening remarks to the, uh, the time you spent dealing with China in the Middle East. Can you say a few words about Russia in the Middle East and how you see the, uh, uh, the challenge that uh, Russia poses to US interests in the region? So the deployment of Russia to Syria, um, I think at the time the administration had thought or had hoped that this would be Russia's quagmire. Um, it turned out that the deployment of 40 fixed wing aircraft, which Russia, Russia was, I think, surprisingly able to sustain and maintain um, for years, um, turned out to change the course of the war and solidify Assad's rule over Syria. And this has emboldened Russia in terms of its role in the region. Um, they are a spoiler. Most problematically, uh, in Libya, where Russian regulars and uh, the Wagner forces, uh, their mercenaries, are deployed um, with the very real prospect of someday setting up permanent bases there on NATO's southern front. Uh, this is uh, very problematic for U.S. interests uh, in the region and for our NATO partners in Europe. Um, they also have played... Uh, a particularly unhelpful role as a spoiler in the region outside of NEA, uh, but still in the Middle East, as far as I'm concerned, with Turkey, um, uh, helping to drive wedges uh, between the United States and this very important NATO partner frenemy um, that uh, with the sale of the S-400s and, and other dealings with, with Erdogan, uh, that just puts space between us and a, an important partner. Um, so I think they are, uh, they're feeling their oats now, um, but it is at the same time costing them money to maintain this. Um, now that oil prices are back up $70 a barrel, maybe Russia will be doing, doing better, uh, but I don't know what the estimates are, something like a billion dollars a year to keep this presence in Syria. It's a drain on, a, on an already challenged economy. But uh, yeah, Russia is um, another um, big challenge for the United States in the region. Um, and I think our presence there helps deny both the Assad regime and Russia, as well as Iran, um, this type of uh, space, uh, battle space in Syria. Okay. Um, we're going to hop around a bit because I have so many questions that people are uh, sending in on all sorts of different topics. Um, one other uh, among several issues that uh, didn't uh, didn't make it to your opening remarks was the theme of uh, uh, democracy, human rights, internal political change, uh, both in our adversaries and in our in our allies. Um, uh, 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 President Trump, um, you know, famously embraced some of our more authoritarian allies, uh, be it the president of Egypt or the leadership in Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, uh, could you talk a bit about your own efforts 
um, uh, in terms of uh, human rights and uh, internal political change um, uh, during your tenure? Yeah, notwithstanding, um, you know, President Trump's affinity for, for President Sisi of Egypt, I think he called him his favorite dictator, um, you know, there was space for me to focus on uh, human rights issues uh, in Egypt and elsewhere. Um, a lot of them as they related to uh, dual nationals or American citizens abroad, uh, but also the bigger um, issues. And so, um, you know, very early on, I was asked on Al Jazeera during the UNGA uh, in 2019, uh, what the US uh, position was on, uh, on protests in Egypt uh, against Sisi. And I said, it, without thinking, uh, that it is um, the position of the United States that the Egyptian people um, have a right to peaceful protest and is the government's obligation to protect peaceful protesters. Um, I was waiting to see if there would be any pushback um, from my boss, um, from Secretary Pompeo. There was not. Um, and in fact, uh, moving forward, uh, the secretary made several statements uh, from the podium at Harry S. Truman about human rights and issue uh, at, in, in Egypt. Um, at my urging. Um, one, uh, the most recent one was his comments about Mohammed Sultan, an American citizen whose family members are arrested in Egypt in an effort to pressure him to drop a lawsuit against uh, Mohammed Biblawi, an Egyptian, former Egyptian prime minister um, who serves at the World Bank. Um, you know, he said uh, from the podium, um, you know, thank you Egypt for releasing some American citizens um, but stop harassing the families of American citizens in Egypt. Um, I'm sure this came um, as a bit of a shock to the government of Egypt, uh, but he said many things publicly, but I said many things publicly. And privately, I engaged um, on human rights with several of our allies, um, uh, including with Saudi Arabia, uh, talking to them about uh, the treatment of Lujain, um, uh, American citizens like Walid Fatehi, um, and other issues in the kingdom that I thought, um, you know, uh, even if they would not be a, 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 an issue that um, would, um, would cause a rift with the administration, um, that um, it would behoove the kingdom um, to move in a certain direction uh, because the Trump administration would not always be here. And Congress matters and uh, administrations matter here in Washington. And uh, it was important to, uh, to make a positive change. And so I engaged um, not only with Saudi and Egypt, but uh, another, a number of countries in the region on this. And I felt like I had the space um, and the support for my leadership to do so. And so just on, on this issue, <clears throat> what in your view is in the realm of the possible? Um, uh, and if, I mean, there's a whole range of issues that, uh, you know, if you had uh, a few minutes with um, uh, Joe Biden or Tony Blinken and they asked your advice, um, that I'm sure that they would benefit greatly on this issue, an issue which the new administration would like to make a uh, uh, more of a central feature of our foreign policy. Um, what, in your view, is in the realm of the possible? Well, um, you know, Rob, I, um, in the old days, I think people used to call me a neocon. Um, I believed in, um, uh, in uh, U.S. interventions to uh, change dynamics and to... Uh, uh, to um, promote our values uh, in foreign countries. Now, I still think it's the right thing to do to intervene, to talk at, to, to speak out on these issues, to put our money where our mouth is. But um, in the aftermath of, of Iraq, I am somewhat chastened um, as to um, our ability to impact uh, domestic politics in, uh, in many Middle Eastern countries. Um, I still think we have to advocate for it. We can, um, uh, condition funding, um, but this won't necessarily force a change. But I think we have to look for areas where our, um, our values intersect with our interests. Um, so at the time I advocated, you know, before the Islamists took hold, I advocated for US military intervention in Syria. Um, but, you know, these things, are, these things are tricky. I think we have to, you know, uh, advocate for what our beliefs are. Um, but I think we have to be realistic, uh, particularly if we are not in a position to invest either militarily or economically at certain levels in these country to try and see these changes through. And uh, can I ask you directly about the question of uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, to what extent did the Khashoggi affair 
color your tenure um, uh, and your relationship with Saudi Arabia? And, and how do you assess how the new team is, is approaching uh, this important relationship? Listen, I knew Jamal. Um, I was appalled at, at what happened to him. The administration moved forward and, and designated 17 people. Uh, I think that was the appropriate response as the information that the, inf that the Biden administration released um, you know, echoed what Gina Haspel, the CIA, said at the time, that there was no smoking gun uh, linking this to, to, uh, uh, to MBS, the Crown Prince, um, Hamid bin Salman. Um, I think that um, you know, it is a critically important relationship to the United States. Um, uh, we can uh, complain um, or um, have, take issue with a number of things uh, that the kingdom has done both uh, before my tenure, um, particularly before my tenure at state, um, whether this was the, the kidnapping of the Lebanese premier, Saad Hariri, whether it's uh, the prosecution of the war in, in, in Yemen, um, whether it was, you know, the uh, the productivity of the Gulf Rift, whether it's breaking off relations with Canada at a certain point because they tweeted about human rights. Um, at the end of the day, um, Saudi is an important partner of the United States. Um, and we want stability there. And we also want to promote some of the, uh, I think, better inclinations uh, the, and developments in Saudi Arabia that have happened in recent years whether that is, you know, um, by and large on the, on the liberalization on the women's front, whether that's on uh, what Al-Itha is doing in the, uh, the Muslim um, the World League or um, in terms of tolerance, recognition of the Holocaust, um, et cetera, um, and of a, a different type of promotion of a different type of Islam abroad. <clears throat> All these are, are important issues to the United States. And I would, uh, I think the Biden administration um, uh, is getting it mostly right so far. Um, you know, they, they uh, revealed uh, their assessment, uh, made it public. Um, uh, they have spoken about uh, their displeasure. They have designated additional people and they'll hold their feet to the fire on this for accountability. Um, but once again, it's important to maintain this relationship. And I think they've, they've got this sort of uh, balancing act right. Okay. So far. Great. So far. So far. Fair enough. Thank you, Dave. Um, uh, let's shift gears, move to a different uh, topic and a, um, a different uh, set of questions. Um, I don't think, uh, um, uh, except in passing, the word Israel has come up uh, very much. Um, now, this is a topic that uh, certainly President Trump had a warm embrace um, with the Israeli political leadership, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. And it's also in terms of the peace process, a topic which was housed um, in an even more unusual fashion, um, not in a special envoy, not in someone who had a, a, a formal um, uh, designated role, but a sort of special advisor in the White House, um, the president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. So uh, can you talk a bit about the US-Israel relationship um, during your tenure and um, how this peace process structure operated um, uh, and um, any lessons that you drive you derive from from that experience uh, thanks well listen I, I just off the top I'll say um, the relationship with Israel um, and I saw it back you know firsthand was the Pentagon from 2002 to 2006. Uh, I saw it at a, at a different level now. Um, it is deeper, stronger, more important to the United States national security than ever before. Um, I know uh, at the Institute, there was a, a paper written some time ago by Mike Eisenstadt and, uh, and David Pollack called Asset Test. Israel is a, a tremendous asset. And, uh, you know, aside from um, the work that we do together and the coordination, um, the intel sharing is just amazing and so valuable um, to the United States. Um, and so I, they are a great partner. And I think when we look around the region, um, their, their stock rises um, in terms of how valuable they are to the United States. Um, you know, you had two key, at the beginning, maybe you had three key players on, on, in terms of Israel and, and uh, peacemaking in the region, uh, dealing with Palestinians. That was a bit, 
uh, Greenblatt, and we had uh, Jared Kushner, of course, uh, and David Friedman, who oh, is a very big player uh, in the U.S. This. ambassador to, to Israel. Yes. Um, and uh, I'm not sure they always agreed on every issue, um, but they ha had a worldview and uh, pushed very hard to move issues forward. And um, certainly within the State Department, um, you know, I will say, uh, you know, without prompting, uh, I did not find there to be uh, this uh, archetypical, you know, Arabist out there who thinks that uh, uh, relations with Israel is a, a drag on um, U.S. ties of the Arab world. I, I don't think that if it ever existed, I don't think it exists anymore. Um, but there was, you know, some, uh, I think, hesitancy to embrace some of the initiatives um, that uh, were promoted out of the White House. Um, and still, they got a way, uh, there was a way to get things done. Um, you know, the finessing of uh, the, pa the Jerusalem passport issue uh, that was done a couple months before the end of the, the administration. Um, something that, you know, may have been unthinkable before that, uh, you know, was a problem for uh, consular affairs. Um, listen, I think um, they were, uh, the approach was disruptive, uh, no doubt. Um, uh, it looked to, for a certain degree of maximum pressure on the Palestinians, um, annexation didn't happen. And in fact, the peace plan, while it didn't move very far, um, created openings, as we saw. Uh, it enabled UAE to do something that UAE had wanted to do anyway. And then Bahrain, and then flexibility on Sudan, and then another type of flexibility by doubling the size of Morocco in a single swoop of the pen, um, you know, more flexibility on that issue they were able to get a lot of things done that while uh, breaking some China, um, I think overall were, were pretty productive. And the relationship uh, is as strong as ever and notwithstanding uh, maybe some personality differences or some, some uh, controversial his um, history uh, between uh, President Biden and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, um, I am confident the relationship will continue to, to grow and serve both of our national interests. And uh, well, thank you for that. It's very interesting. Um, uh, can you give us your take on where the Palestinian issue fits uh, these days um, uh, in overall um, Arab engagement with the United States? Yeah, even before the administration came in, it was, uh, I think, uh, clear that this was, uh, you know, sort of deprioritized. Um, you saw it in the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was about domestic politics uh, in these countries, about governance, about corruption, about uh, economic opportunity. It was not about, you know, pan-Arab ideology of Palestinian uh, cause. Um, I think it was all about parochial um, or domestic interests in these countries. And I think that carried through what you saw um, with the deals with the Emirates, with Bahrain, uh, with Sudan, with Morocco. Uh, that the states recognize that uh, Palestinian leadership is not there. It's not going to necessarily be able to move forward and, and make a deal. And these states are not willing any longer uh, to hold uh, their national interests, their parochial individual national interests hostage to the Palestinian cause, particularly when they have little optimism that this Palestinian government um, is going to be able to move forward in a productive way with Israel and normalization uh, or, or on the peace track. Um, so I think that's you know where we stand today. Uh, Saudi Arabia may be the outlier. I think that's a maybe a, a generational issue with King Salman. Um, but we see you know reports um, when I was in um, in uh, Neom with uh, Secretary Pompeo a few months ago. It was reported that. Prime Minister Netanyahu had been there just, just shortly before. There's a report, I think, today that Prime Minister Netanyahu might um, is negotiating for a meeting with MBS. Um, so I, I think attitudes are changing. There's some states that aren't going to take that route. Kuwait, not going to happen. Tunisia, not going to happen. Um, but other states, I think, are, are looking, taking a hard look at their interests, where they lie vis-a-vis -vis national security and economic development and see Israel as a, as a productive partner. Actually, your, your comment earlier about uh, uh, this report by our colleagues, um, um, Dave Pollack and Mike Eisenstadt called the Asset Test, gives me an opportunity to uh, remind our audience um, of our transition papers because Mike and David have just produced um, an updated report 
um, Asset Test 2021, how the uh, U.S.-Israel relationship can continue to benefit um, America. And I urge everyone to take a close look at that fascinating report and all the ways, um, not just in security and intel, but on the entire range of civil issues, um, health, technology, um, uh, artificial intelligence, et cetera, in which um, uh, the United States benefits from this important partnership. L but let me ask you about the, this fascinating sort of policy decision the Trump administration did, which was to uh, barter, if you will, um, uh, uh, assets on other issues in order to promote Arab-Israel normalization. So for example, the, the agreement um, uh, with uh, Sudan on, on uh, um, its listing as uh, a terror supporting state or the recognition by the Trump administration of the Moroccan claim to the Sahara. Um, uh, uh, in your view, are, are these reasonable um, uh, uh, things for the Trump administration to have put on the table? Do they advance overall American security interests in, uh, in the Middle East on balance? On balance, I think they do. Um, so we took at one point Gaddafi off the terrorism list when he, um, uh, when he uh, uh, re met his obligations on paying off the victims for Pan Am, Lockerbie. Um, Sudan um, had, uh, had paid off, you know, for Dar es Salaam and, and what happened there. I think there's still got some exposure for uh, the World Trade Center bombing. Um, but, uh, and the one that I, I'm most intimately involved in was uh, with Morocco. Um, as you know, I went in January to Dakhla, the first uh, senior American official to go to the Western Sahara. What did you um, do wrong? <laughs> no, it, was, it was tremendous. I would go again in a heartbeat. They were very, happy to, see me. They were very happy to see me. But, I, you know, I, it's important to point out, you know, on the way uh, to Morocco, um, first, um, the Moroccans wanted to do this deal, right? And they saw an opportunity um, to get something that they want, which was a change in the U.S. Um, uh, policy on Western Sahara. Um, and... Uh, you know, you have to question, you know, whether our interests lie with um, with the Polisario or um, or with you know this longtime ally, um, Morocco, is a very close Middle East ally, an important friend of an FTA, et cetera. Um, I don't think the administration, the White House, lost much sleep about this. Now, on my way to Morocco, I did stop off. In Algeria, I had said earlier that I had been trying to get there for some time because they were, they are an important counterterrorism part, partner, and there's a lot we can do with them. Um, and I wanted to go and talk with uh, Foreign Minister Bukadum, um, and this is after the announcement on the Western Sahara. Um, obviously, it was not, um, it was not a fun meeting um, to go see the Algerian Foreign Minister at this time. Uh, nevertheless, the engagement is important. And I don't think, you know, based on the statements from the Algerians after the announcement, that this, you know, fouls the relationship. I think we have to take advantage of many opportunities with them. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, you have changed um, the dynamic across North Africa now, opening up other opportunities uh, for, for Israel, for, Mor for Morocco, and for our cooperation with Morocco by virtue of this deal. And um, uh, while there may be uh, international law issues that we have to hammer out at the UN and elsewhere, um, you know, State Department lawyers are very good at finding the right answers to these kind of questions. All right, very good, thank you. So we have about uh, 10 minutes left. I have about 50 questions that people have sent in. We're not gonna be able to get to them all, um, but there are some that I did wanna focus on in our and our few minutes uh, left to this fascinating hour with you, Dave. Um, a lot of people are asking me, all right, we've seen what President Obama did vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Um, uh, uh, we saw what President Trump did vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Um, neither, act, neither achieved its ultimate objective. Um, now we're having a new effort, um, not quite what President Obama did, not quite what President Trump did, um, what would you what would you urge President Biden to do? How do you see the Iran 
the, the entire Iran policy developing. Um, do you see a, a good outcome possible for, uh, for American diplomacy on this important topic? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, first, let me say, um, you know, there are, there are critics out there who say, you know, based on the personnel that the administration has employed, Wendy Fairman, Rob Malley, you, know, you look at the, the list, they say they're, you know, they're getting the band back together. And this is Obama three. Um, they don't have, as far as I can tell, they don't have the team on the field yet. They haven't taken steps one way or the other. I, I, I saw the, the hearings for Wendy Fairman, et cetera. Um, I think they understand that, uh, that the times have changed and, um, and are going to take a, a different approach. And I think a different approach is warranted. First, um, let's say they recognize that there is a certain amount of leverage here. Uh, maximum pressure campaign did not succeed in, in, uh, in bringing us, bringing Iran to the table, but it succeeded in putting an enormous amount of pressure and bringing the United States quite a bit of leverage um, that should encourage Iran to come to the table because they don't want another four years of this. Um, you know, time is not on their side. Um, I would, I would uh, counsel patience from the administration. I think so far that we're seeing that. Um, uh, second um, is that um, the deal cannot be the same. I know what Iran is saying, you know, go back to the same deal. I know what President Biden has said as well, which is that we have to, you know, consider and talk about the regional meddling as well. This is all the militias, whether it's in Iraq, uh, Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, uh, that Iran cannot any longer have a free pass or carte blanche for its funding, equipping, training, all these terrorist militia that destabilize the Middle East, that they have to be held to account for that. And my belief is that this cannot be disaggregated along with the ballistic missiles from the nuclear agreement. Now, we can agree that the most pressing issue is a nuclear agreement, um, but we cannot let go or give up on these other issues. They have to be in the calculation. And I'm hoping, I'm not confident, but I'm hoping um, that you know, when the, this administration is at the table with the Iranians, um, that these issues can be incorporated, um, that Iran in any deal on the nuclear front um, does not have um, an agreement whereby no sanctions of any kind can ever be leveled against the Islamic Republic ever again. Right? There has to be American recourse. At the same time, um, when Iranian proxies attack Americans, whether it's um, in Iraq, um, when eventually a Houthi missile fired into Saudi Arabia kills one of the 100,000 Americans there, it isn't the proxies that have to help be held responsible alone. They have to be held responsible, but their masters have to be held responsible too. There has to be a degree of accountability for Tehran. They can't wash their hands of this. And I hope the administration um, starts taking that under consideration as well. I'm not calling for a war, but I'm calling for real deterrence. For real deterrence against Iran. Yes. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, um, uh, I have quite a few um, questions from, from a country that is connected to um, the Iranian challenge. And th these are the, uh, the Lebanese that you know so well. Um, uh, your earlier comments about having helped avoid um, bad ideas, um, uh, if I can you know, summarize it that way, helping keep uh, the French, as you said, from making some, some uh, initiatives that, that, that were not so helpful. But what do you say to, to Lebanese? Will, will they be forever under the thumb of, uh, of Hezbollah? Or is there something that you suggest the Americans do um, differently vis-a-vis -vis that, uh, that arena? Well, it's not just under the thumbs of Hezbollah. It's you know, under the thumbs of uh, the Zulama, this, uh, this perennial leadership of the country uh, that has demonstrated whether through uh, port disaster, the financial crisis, not moving ahead with a you know, realistic proposal on, um, uh, on the, the maritime dispute. Um, 
uh, that they have a, a sort of a blatant disregard for the well-being of the Lebanese people. So it's not only Hezbollah, but certainly Hezbollah is at, at the crux of, of the issue here. Um, so I think part of what we did, and I would encourage the current administration to continue with, is to not only sanction Hezbollah, to sanction Hezbollah's allies and to sanction corrupt people, to send a very clear message that um, you can no longer have a bank account in Europe um, if you are not only stealing the money of the Lebanese, but trucking with Hezbollah and helping to keep them in their, their position. Um, Lebanese people are coming out in greater numbers again to protest uh, in their country. Uh, there are 50% of the people that are below the poverty line, 25% of the people that are destitute. The World Bank just passed um, a $247 million social safety net program that'll feed 180,000 Lebanese families for a year. All this is very good, but we have to start holding people in Lebanon accountable. The Lebanese people are trying to hold their leadership accountable, uh, but will not be able to succeed and they need outside help. Um, it would be great if our European partners started operating this way as well, instead of uh, trying to cajole Hezbollah to be more productive in government formation. Um, this is missing the issue here, right? They've got to change their ways and reform. It's not about government formation alone. All right. Very good. Um, Dave, we're, we're coming to the close of our hour. Uh, the Biden administration famously wants to um, uh, uh, downsize the role of the Middle East and overall American foreign policy. And there's a debate that's emerging on the appropriate, the appropriate role. Um, but of course, those of us who follow the region so closely know that uh, regardless of whatever the intent of the administration is, uh, events, as a former British prime minister once said, will have a way of, of drawing America back in. So before we close, can you look around the Middle East and um, uh, point out a couple of places that you think, or a couple of issues that you think may not be on the agenda or high enough on the agenda, but that are likely over the course of this administration to impose themselves in one way or another, uh, and that the administration would be wise to prepare itself for, um, for engaging on these issues um, in, in the right fashion. Well, you know, Rob, uh, they say, I, I can't predict the past. <laughs> hard to predict the future, but um, listen, I, I think that you're going to see in the next six months um, a, a spike in demonstrations in the region. I don't know if this is going to be a, a redo of uh, redux of uh, the Arab Spring, uh, but I would anticipate that you're going to see large numbers of people come out complaining uh, about the economy. It's going to be this time a revolution of the hungry. Um, the economic conditions that persisted in 2011 persist today nothing has changed and COVID has made matters worse and we're going to see people come out and the administration is going to have to um, handle that one way or the other. And as you know, uh, the Obama administration, you know, it was damned if they do, damned if they don't um, on these, on these demonstrations is very hard to manage. I think that's uh, one issue that's going to present itself. I think um, I wouldn't be surprised in, you know, six months down the road, if, if the Houthis try and send, uh, attack Israel, shoot something at a lot, um, Lord knows they're feeling their oats right now. Um, and backed by Iran, that they have, uh, they have grown capabilities. Um, I think, um, look, I think you could be headed for, um, uh, difficulties with the U S Egypt relationship. Um, it was already, I think, troubled in many ways, but the announcement, uh, the readout of Secretary Blinken's phone call with his with Sami Shukri, his, the foreign minister of Egypt, where he said that uh, human rights will be at the center of our, of our bilateral relationship with Egypt. Um, that's a recipe for uh, for conflict. So I, I don't know what that looks like um, or the purchase of uh, Egypt's purchase of the Su-35 advanced Russian fighter jets triggering um, uh, triggering CASA sanctions. There are a whole bunch of crises that I see before. And so you're, you're right. Now, we can try and get out of the Middle East, but uh, uh, we will be drawn back in one way or the other. Dave Schenker, um, uh, just completing service as Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs, 
back now as my colleague, senior fellow at the Washington Institute. Thank you so much for this uh, revealing our discussion on your experience. And I can only hope that people inside the new administration are listening because I think there's an awful lot of wisdom in what you have to say. So uh, friends online, um, uh, both on Zoom and on all the other platforms, thank you for joining us for this special Washington Institute event. And I look forward to seeing you again 